Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Kimberly Harrison, and I am a, a clinical psychologist based in Houston, Texas. And I'm very happy to be here today uh, to present to you on uh, some things that might be able to help uh, parents uh, helping their children with impulsivity, that impulsive factor um, that has so much to do uh, with day-to-day -day functioning with ADHD. Here's just a little bit about me. and I don't have any conflict of interest or commercial support relating to this presentation. So I am a cognitive behavioral therapist by training. And so I always have goals. In fact, in my education center at my offices, I have a stenciled on the wall, a goal without a plan is just a wish. And so I find it uh, very important to always aim for um, a target and let's see if we can uh, hit most of it. So first we're gonna define some types of impulsivity because impulsivity is not just one thing. And you don't treat all types of impulsivity the same way. And so uh, before we can talk about what to do, we have to know more about what it is. Uh, we're going to review some basic information about ADHD as it relates to impulsive behavior. Many of you are probably experts on the topic by now, but we want to make sure that uh, we're looking at the pieces that are important to consider with impulsivity. We're going to discuss strategies for engaging impulsive children and teens in focused work at home and at school. Now, I've designed this to broadly cover all ages. At different ages and stages, we find impulsivity shows up a little differently. I'll highlight that from time to time, but uh, I've tried to, to cover um, many of the different ages and stages. I'm looking uh, more in this conversation uh, at children and teenagers rather than adults, but quite often some of these strategies are very helpful for adults as well. Uh, we're gonna learn some interventions for improving negative behaviors and negative emotional responses, and then create some tools for children and teens to use um, that will help them use their energy for productive purposes. Um, I, I often uh, tease and, and, uh, and uh, talk with my, my uh, students that I work with that, you know, we want to use your powers for good, not evil. And so we, we like being superheroes. Well, starting off, impulsivity is acting without thinking first. I think we all know that. Um, with impulsivity, it's always now. Um, and, and I think that's really important to remember. And you'll hear me mention it several times today. It's always now. Impulsivity can bring about serious safety issues, not to mention some emotional and behavioral consequences. And so it's very important that we uh, figure out ways to address it. Now in the moment, in, in the now, the person does not have cognitive access to things that they should know. Quite often I hear parents and teachers say, well, they know better. They should know that. They should know if this, then this or they should know that they shouldn't be doing this. Um, but in the moment, that's what impulsivity does. It steals your ability to think in the moment of anything other than what's right in front of you. The past fades away, future consequences aren't considered, and it takes over and actually blocks higher level thinking. Um, it's very important to know, and we're gonna um, look at some different ways of considering this next bullet point here, Interest drives attention. And you know, if you think about it, when you're interested in something, you pay attention to it. And the impulsive person finds something interesting in the now, and then that steals the attention. Impulsivity occurs when it's always now meets the next interesting thing. So what are the types of impulsivity? There's three basic types, and you know we could split these into more categories if you wanted, but I, I think these three categories summarize uh, the, the most important parts of it. So there's physical impulsivity. Now this often and almost always coexists with hyperactivity, but it's different. This is not hyperactivity. Hyperactivity involves just being overly physical, moving a lot, but physical impulsivity means the person's person uses their body inappropriately without seeming to notice. And that's the important thing about impulsivity. It's, it's almost like they don't notice they're doing it. So sometimes we see hitting or kicking or biting or rough 
play, these kinds of things. I, I once had a child um, who was in, I think, kindergarten, and um, the parents, you know, had, had been called by the school because during circle time for reading, the child just real quickly climbed on the bookcase and dive bombed the, the reading circle. Um, in, in didn't really seem to know what made them want to do that, other than I'm um, sure sitting there saw the bookcase and thought, oh, that would be cool to climb. Uh, so that physical impulsivity is is um, often uh, involves safety issues. So we have to really look at ways to manage that. Verbal impulsivity, things like blurting out in class, saying inappropriate things, talking back. Uh, so the, the verbal part we often see uh, with individuals with uh, this more impulsive, hyperactive type of attention deficit. And then there's also the emotional impulsivity. And uh, that usually includes just overreactions, shutdowns or meltdowns just in the moment. Um, uh, sometimes I hear people say it was just like they went from zero to 60, just boom, before I could blink my eyes. And so that, that emotional um, impulsivity leads to these big feelings. Um, sometimes they even look like oppositional behaviors. Uh, but what I find is much of the time, uh, things that are considered to be oppositional are really anxiety related and more uh, that, that fight. When you go into anxiety, fight, fight or freeze. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. So here's, here's the question, right? What can you do to manage impulsivity if it's always now? Well, there's two things you can do, two broad categories, and we'll be looking at each of these in detail. You can modify the child or modify the situation. That's what you can do. There are many ways to modify the child. You, this is not a talk on medication, but medication is one of those ways. You, you increase the dopamine and norepinephrine when you take stimulant medication, and that allows the electrical uh, circuits in the brain to work more efficiently while the medicine is in their system, and that helps manage impulsivity. So medication is one piece. Sleep is another, and nutrition is another, and strategies, which is what I think most people want, right? You know, what can I do that's not medicine? Uh, strategies, habits, and routines. We'll spend quite a bit of time talking about that. You can also modify the situation. So we want to learn ways to set up the situations for success and avoid some of the common pitfalls, both at home and at school. And I'll try to uh, talk about both settings and, and then just some other settings, especially with the holidays coming up. What do we do at grandparents' house? Or what do we do when we're traveling? And so um, we want to look at some uh, different situation-specific types of impulsivity that are likely to happen. And there's many reasons why it's important to help a person manage impulsivity. Um, number one, safety. Safety is, is critical and it, uh, impulsivity of all of the features of attention deficit is the one feature that uh, tends to have more safety implications. There's also social fallout. The person who's always blurting out or you know, physically doing things to hurt others is, um, is, is not going to get along well with, with peers. It really tends to cause a problem. And then of course, as with all of the other features of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, it's going to interfere with learning. And it's going to interfere with participating in day-to-day -day activities. Um, even things like having dinner with the family, uh, going to an after-school program or baseball or ballet class. Uh, so uh, it, it interferes in all aspects of life. As a psychologist, one of the pieces that I consider to be extremely important is the damage to self-esteem that individuals with uh, uh, extra impulsivity uh, tend to experience. This, eventually, this low self-esteem eventually leads to depression and anxiety as a person becomes older, not, not always, but quite often. And I tend to um, work with those who are struggling with that, the adolescents and adults. And um, it, it, you know, when a person hears their name yelled negatively, you know, stop that, don't do that. What are you doing? 
over and over and over, uh, they develop low self-esteem. And so we see this little um, cycle here that we have impulsive behavior, leads to a negative reaction in someone, and then the person feels bad about it, and then there's another piece of impulsivity. And repetition of this cycle will create low self-esteem. Okay, so some basic information about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, we know that's the official name in the uh, field of psychology and psychiatry. We uh, use the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And so the official name when we are labeling attention deficit is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And we name one of the three subtypes. There's predominantly hyperactive impulsive type, and the hyperactivity and the impulsivity usually live together. Uh, you can have more impulsivity, more hyperactivity, but they're usually seen together. You can have predominantly inattentive type, but most people have a combined type where they have a little bit of all of those features. Now, ADHD is not bad behavior. And that's, that's something that when I um, do teacher workshops, uh, quite often I'll, I'll do an in-service workshop for teachers, and, you know, the, the questions are, how can we change this bad behavior? And the result of ADHD-stimulated actions often is bad behavior. But it's not willful misbehavior. And, it's, you know, the old adage of a child with a broken leg who can't run fast, and we don't penalize them for slowing, for slowness, well, they're given support. And because the behaviors are usually skewed with attention deficit, a lot of times, Adults, parents, teachers are just like, oh, that bad behavior and, and um, aren't really looking at addressing some of the major issues. And the more often a child is told that he or she is bad, the greater the chance of emotion dysregulation and low self-esteem. Now, the ADHD child has that impulsivity, which leads to things that can be considered bad behavior. With executive function de deficits, which attention deficit disorder is a disorder that involves the executive functions. And I'm sure most of you have heard quite a bit about these over time, but one of the things that I find is not discussed very often is that there is an actual developmental delay with the executive functions. And so if you're wondering what are those executive functions, I always hear people talk about they're these in the box, self-management to time, initiating or getting started on things, planning and organizing your thinking, which is the problem solving part of organizing, uh, working memory, which is cognitive flexibility, holding on to thoughts, uh, organizing materials, shifting from task to task. Those are the major executive functions and impulsivity impacts all of these areas of executive function. But here in, the, in this blue right here, this is important. Like age seven, most children with attention deficit have a two to three year delay in these executive functions. Um, during, during preschool and maybe the early years of elementary, it may be a year, year and a half. Um, but this is really important to know because if you have, let's say, a fifth grader and uh, parents and teachers are saying, you know, she should just know how to get started on stuff. Well, if there's a three-year delay, a second grader may not know how to get started on fifth grade work. Now, the person may have the cognitive ability and understand the work and know how to go about it, but they not, might not know how to sit down and just propel themselves into it. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but over, over many years, I, I tried and, and just struggled to find ways to explain in a real user-friendly way to parents and teachers, how does all this work? What is this executive functioning? And so th this is based on research and this is based on neurobiology, but it's just a, it's kind of a little diagram that um, I find explains it. It's, a, it's a, you know, not exact. You're not going to find this in a textbook give a disclaimer, but it, this is sort of what it's like. So the information that, that we all encounter through a day, whether it's in a classroom or at home or just you know, out at the store, uh, it comes in through our uh, five senses. And so information comes in and it comes to the brain in the prefrontal cortex. So you, have, you see something, you touch something, you 
hear or taste or smell something, and, and that message comes up here. And then the brain has to decide what to do with it. And so there's like a great big switch. Now, this is where your executive functions are. It's more than just a switch. It's millions of electron circuits. But it's kind of like if the switch is in the up position, all this information comes in, and sometimes too much information comes in. So when there's too much information coming in, then that leads to hyperactivity and impulsivity because the person's like, what do I look at next? What do I, what am I hearing next? What, ooh, this taste. They, they, they bring too much information. in. Now, if the switch is stuck kind of in the down position, then there's more inattention going on. And it's kind of like the message doesn't go through. Now, for all of us, you know, the average switch would just be pay attention to this, don't pay attention to this, pay attention to this, don't pay attention to this. But attention deficit is essentially, if you use uh, this little model here, uh, attention deficit is a switch that doesn't quite work right. And so we want to um, be able to help manage that. The, the way that we start really addressing the style of thinking that creates impulsivity. Uh, I, I want to show you through this other uh, set of diagrams that I came up with several years ago, again, to try to explain this very complex situation in simple terms. So as we go through the what do you do part, I want you to keep one part of your mind thinking about the switch because we're going to refer to that, and the other part to this diagram of ladders and wagon wheels. And so um, most of the world operates in a very uh, structured linear system. Um, from back in, in the uh, beginning of time, these were probably the hunters. They had a, something that they were tracking. They were rather quiet, solitary, and kept very focused and, and, and went and followed the prey and then eventually succeeded, came back, helped keep the community alive with whatever work that they did and then went back and did it again. And so it's probably only about 10% of the community had that really great ability to focus and stay on track. The rest were what I call wagon wheels. And wagon wheels are circular thinkers. They're, uh, they're probably the gatherers who you know, have to scan the environment all the time. Uh, they tend to go uh, wherever their interest takes them. So remember earlier I said interest drives attention. And so the wagon wheels are always scanning, usually multitasking. You know, back in early community, they helped keep people alive by um, foraging, and then they were very relational. Um, they had some, some really strong in intuition and intuitive abilities, uh, very creative. These are the people who invented things, and they were just doing whatever needed to be done in the moment. And so we fast forward through time, and I think it's switched because the latter people, the linear people throughout history are the ones who organize things. And so more and more people began to think like ladders and, and, and evolve to be ladder-like people. And so most people can, you know, get up in the morning, get dressed, eat breakfast, uh, leave and go to school or work, do the work, come home, do the homework or clean the house or do whatever the after uh, after, after hours require, and then go to bed and then start over. Um, so I think about 90% of us can do that. It doesn't mean you like it, right? This is not, this doesn't have anything to do with enjoying, but it's, you know, uh, you can probably do it. I think there's about 10% from what I can tell who are now true wagon wheels. Now, some people have features, right? We're not going to get into all of that today, but let's just say the true wagon wheels. Um, the most recent uh, data that I have from the CDC is about 5.3% of the U.S. population has attention deficit. I think those numbers are in the process of changing with the new census that's that's coming out. But let's say 5%. And I think there's probably another 5% that might not have an attention deficit, uh, can be very focused, but just really can't live on the ladder. And so maybe uh, artists, entrepreneurs, uh, people who, who just, you know, uh, see things differently and live life differently. And um, so I'd say about 10% are over here in the in the wagon and milk category. Well, why am I spending so much time telling you about this right now? Well, this is where impulsivity lives. 
but most people with ADHD are wagon wheels. And if you think about it, there's a couple of major differences between these, these two options here. With a ladder, you always know where to start. Remember in that executive function slide, is it initiate, getting started is hard? Well, look at all the options a wagon wheel has. There's, there's too many. And then which direction do you go? Do you go forward? Do you go backwards? Do you just do the more fun thing and bounce around? Um, the, the circular thinker has more options. And they tend to choose the option of how to get started, how to approach a task, what to do with whatever's interesting and grabs their attention. And say it again, interest drives attention. And so the wagon wheel has sensory input that's always giving something more interesting. And if they're trying to do a boring task, let's say homework or clean their room, and there's something more interesting, like, oh, look at the bird out the window, or, ah, I can make a paper airplane out of this, this whatever uh, math worksheet, um, that's more interesting. And so without thinking, their brain naturally shifts. So remember the wagon wheel, remember the ladder, we're going to talk about them. Because now we're going to talk about how to address impulsivity through modifying the child. Uh, this is the only part of medication I'll just touch on because I think it is important. There's pros and cons. And some families um, are, are using medication and it works and it's helpful. And some families um, don't uh, want to or can't or the child can't tolerate it. So it's um, and it's pros and cons. As a psychologist, I don't really have a horse in that race because I, I'm the everything but medication person. But because impulsivity can bring about serious safety issues, not to mention emotional and behavior consequences, medication can really help with managing impulsive symptoms. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't say, look, if it's something you haven't tried and you're thinking about it, it might be worth trying. Talk to your medical professional. Talk to a, a pediatrician or a psychiatrist and see what they have to say about it. Um, but it's usually about 85% effective. So if it works, it works really well. Um, it can help the child be in control of themselves. And then the strategies have a much better chance of working. Um, the cons are not all children can tolerate the medication. Medication doesn't change behaviors or habits. And most children aren't medicated 24 hours per day. So impulsivity still can wreak some havoc. All right. So if you're taking medicine, um, plan extracurricular activities and homework around the medication cycles. And I think you've probably figured that out if you are um, using medication. And when medication wears off, um, sometimes impulsive children are not able to participate well in group activities. So choose activities where they can be successful. If they're not medicated or um, they take medication during the school day and not after, um, then things like swimming, for example, could be better than baseball. With the um, swimming is more solitary, you're able to focus more, especially in the water if you have the lanes guiding you rather than on the baseball field with all of um, the many distractions and having to keep up with, with the ball. Now, some kids with ADHD are great baseball players. So I don't want you to you know, assume that uh, I'm talking for, for all, but you know, you've seen your child and if group activities aren't working, then maybe do something more solitary or just have creative play, um, which is <laughs> I'm a huge fan of. I'll be a talk for another day. Um, so have a plan for homework when they can focus best. If a child can't do schoolwork without medication, then they're probably going to struggle doing homework without medication. So you have to be creative. Um, look at some different places. Maybe stay and do homework in the school library where there's fewer distractions or do homework in the morning after taking medication instead of in the afternoon. So you've got to plan differently and maximize the times when focus is best. And be realistic. When you rush or try to have a child accomplish more than they're able, that's when meltdowns and shutdowns occur. And no one accomplishes the goal if there's a meltdown. All right. So sleep. This is another way that you can modify the child. Many children with ADHD have trouble falling asleep because they have a hyperstimulated system. And this isn't medication related at all. Just children who have more information coming into their brain. Remember the switch in the up position? It's harder to shut it down. The, the 
slippery slope is that when you're not fully rested, impulsive behavior is worse. So creating a sleep hygiene routine, which allows for a winding down of the day, is critical. So many things to do. Read, take a bath, listen to music. Some kids with impulsivity and hyperactivity do real well with meditation. Um, one-on-one -on -one snuggle time. No electronics. I was going to put this at the top in big, bold letters. Um, you have to really monitor the uh, use of electronics especially during the week. Uh, again, that's a conversation for another day, but it's not helpful in this context for creating a sleep hygiene routine. Have an old-fashioned alarm clock. So many preteens and teens, you know, they're like, I have to have my cell phone. It's my alarm. No, I, I just bought one on Amazon for $9.99. Nice old-fashioned alarm clock. They've got great ones. Um, you may or may not want to add melatonin an over-the-counter supplement. If you do take melatonin, read the labels carefully. Um, the, it's one of the most misused over-the-counter um, supplements because you need to take it at the time you're lying down. It's not a sleeping pill. It's not a narcotic. Um, it just goes into your system, connects with the melatonin that your body makes when you're horizontal and the lights are low. So you want to take it right when you're going to be horizontal and the lights go low. And then your the brain gets some extra um, of the that hormone that helps you fall asleep. Um, so sleep hygiene very important. Uh, nutrition, you know, now there's a lot of theories about whether nutrition influences ADHD uh, related behaviors, and if so, what helps and what hurts. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the theories. Uh, a lot of literature says, you know, it doesn't really help. Um, I, I think. It, each family, you know, has their own philosophy on that. And there's actually lots of things that help. So you just have to find what works for your child. But the, the bottom line is proper nutrition, right? I'm not talking supplements and, and crazy diets and all of that. Sometimes it's, you find a specialty um, diet or system that works really well for your child. That's great. But just in general, there's some basic things. Make sure there's enough calories in the day. Um, you know, a child with um, who takes stimulant medication needs to front load and back load the calories, figure out how many calories they need, and make sure they get the calories. Now, some uh, children and teens with ADHD are overweight, and so, again, you want to just balance the caloric intake. Sometimes there's a mindless eating that goes along with inattention. Um, Balanced diet, right? Okay, I'm saying it out loud just because, I, yeah, I think we sometimes forget. You know, protein, carbs, fat, all of that important. Limit refined sugars. This is best practice for everyone. Um, and know that complex carbohydrates create longer-term uh, energy streams. So have some complex carbs. Make sure there's some protein. Um, I think we often forget the basics of nutrition, and there's endless literature that says this is really good for you. You may or may not have some specialty things that work as well. Okay, so strategies. This is what everybody wants. I am asked about strategies uh, more than anything else. Um, strategies are based on habits and routines. They're based on habits and routines. A one-off, just do this one time, doesn't help anybody. So you have to have a habit of using a strategy. And a routine is a series of habits, which then requires practice. Um, strategies do tend to work best in combination with medication and situation modifications, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, since in the moment, in the now, the child may find something more interesting. And so you want to try to help them focus on the strategy. Now, here's the good news, bad news, guys, and this is where most parents and teachers give up um, and, and they don't give it enough time. Habits take four to six weeks to take hold. And I wish, I wish I could make that different. I wish I had a magic wand and we could all just fast forward into instant habits. But that is not how a habit is created. A habit is actually creating a new pathway in the brain. And, and providing electrical energy to that pathway. And so you have to be consistent and persistent when helping your child learn a strategy. 
um, if you want strategies, and that's going to be your primary method of helping manage impulsivity, it's not instant, it's not a quick fix. Now, habits can last a lifetime, and if you spend four to six weeks on the front end, you may reap amazing benefits. I see it happen for people who have stick to um, One of the, the issues that I deal with as a, as a clinician in private practice, I may see a child once a week, but then the habit has to translate and be carried out seven days a week. So I may teach the child something, but then if they don't practice it at home, if the parents forget or aren't invested or the teenagers is like, yeah, I'll just do it next week when I see Dr. H, then it doesn't become a habit and it doesn't really help. And then after a few weeks, people will come back to me and say, well, that just didn't work. Well, no, it's not going to if we don't put that time in on the front end. Um, routines are actually habits strung together and they provide structure, which can then override impulsivity. And this is really important because if we have habits and routines made of several different habits, then it's, it's like the brain just has that lane and impulsivity doesn't really have as much room to get, go in and get involved. Um, and so it can be really effective. Uh, considerable help or scaffolding is usually required um, to assist a child with impulsivity and developing these strategies. Because of impulsivity, they don't have that ability quite often to stick to it. So how do we create a habit? <laughs> well, basic behaviorism, reinforcers and consequences. It's how we shape our children's behavior to work within our boundaries, um, whatever we're trying to get them to do. Um, it's the basic principle of behavior change. And again, I wish I could fast forward this into something more important or, or easier or you know, whatever, but um, this, is, this is how it works. Um, to be effective, reinforcers and consequences have to be immediate. So just saying, well, um, later tonight I'll give you a reward doesn't help. Um, that's where stickers and tick marks and things like that come in so that there's a visible in the moment reminder. Um, the difficulty with those kinds of systems is you have to be consistent and have access to whatever it is that you create to uh, provide as a re reinforcer. Um, consequences, they're designed to decrease an unwanted behavior and reinforcers are uh, designed to increase a wanted behavior. You can have positive and negative consequences and positive and negative reinforcers. The difference is positive you add something to, Negative is you take something away. So a positive consequence is add something like an extra worksheet or making an apology um, to decrease an unwanted behavior. Um, the most uh, powerful consequence is taking away something like screen time. You're taking away something to decrease an unwanted behavior. But the literature tells us that positive reinforcers work much better than consequences. And so you add something. It can be very simple, like praise or re a reward. The moment the wanted behavior happens, and then that helps increase that behavior. Or sometimes you can take something away, like, oh, you don't have to do that worksheet now that you've done such a good job on this other part of the homework. Um, but just remember, consequences decrease unwanted behaviors, reinforcers increase wanted behaviors. And you really just want to have more good behaviors, right? So let's start putting all of this together. Remember, it's always now, and that's why traditional consequences don't work. Past behaviors have evaporated from awareness. Future rewards are not consciously present. Often children will be overly emotional when consequences are implemented because they forgot what they did. That's also why reinforcers need to be at that point of presentation. To foster motivation, children, uh, the child needs to connect this present behavior, this good thing I just did, to a sense of accomplishment before they can move on. You know, this is also tied to that shift feature because motivation helps us shift in a wanted direction. So be creative with your reinforcers. Um, sometimes tra traditional behavior charts are helpful, but think outside the box. Uh, traditional behavior charts are hard to keep up with, frankly. Everybody does them for a day or two or maybe a week, and then it's hard to keep them going. Um, I did put a resource at the end uh, in the slides of a book that I love called Behavior Charts and Beyond with some 
uh, really cool things. Like you have the child draw a picture, cut it into squares, and then every time the child does something right, they get a square of their picture back and they put it together like a jigsaw puzzle until they have the whole thing assembled. Um, you can have a little um, post-it note. I like to have post-it notes pretty much everywhere I am. Maybe put it on the corner of a desk and just walk by and do tick marks if it's homework time, or maybe the teacher can do that. Again, these are really low maintenance kinds of things. Um, have the child turn in part of an assignment or part of a homework um, task and then report back after completing that section for high fives and then go right back. You want to fight against the impulses. So there's endless things a child can learn to do to fight against an impulse. They have to practice these until they become a habit. And then the habit can be stronger than the impulse. So I like to use things that are always there. Um, there's lots of creative ideas that ideas out there, but if you don't have it, the things with you, the materials or whatever, you're not going to you know, be able to use the strategy. So hands, really great things. Um, I don't have it on this list, but fidget with your digits. The, your fingers are your original fidget cube and learn some very specific um, ways to manage your uh, impulsivity just by using your digits. Circle palm. We have more nerve endings in the palm of our hand than almost anywhere else in our body. I always joke with the kids because you know, your feet has more nerve endings, but just don't go around playing with your feet. <laughs> uh, but circle palm where you just circle, you can circle on the inside or the outside. Uh, you can count backwards from 10 or backwards from 100. Backwards slows down the impulsivity because you have to actually use your logic. Um, you can develop a mantra, slow it down, think it through. Um, I'll have a system with a lot of the kids that I work with uh, on making impulse control glasses. And so some of them do this. The ones who like to do something more difficult do this. And it is kind of fun. And so put on the impulse control glasses. It can stop and make um, the child think about something uh, as an alternate uh, right before the impulsivity takes over. Because this is more interesting, isn't it? This is something interesting that can do. Notice we're talking about interesting things you can do. Um, talk to yourself if it's not disruptive in the middle of the classroom or something. And give them ways to move and talk and stay on track. Um, a worry bead bracelet. Um, if, if a child uh, enjoys a scented uh, intervention, a little scented uh, fabric that they keep handy. They even have nice little lockets and bracelets you can get um, online where you put just a, a little bit of um, uh, scented oil on a felt piece and it goes inside the locket or the necklace. Um, redirection. So here's another thing that parents and teachers can do that can help the impulsivity when they see it starting to ramp up or when there's something boring that's going on and you know that this impulsive child is probably not going to be able to tolerate it, develop a system for redirection which can be interesting. So it could just be eye contact. You know, we, we sometimes um, disregard the things that can be um, really helpful. Just make eye contact. Have a visual cue like a stop sign or a verbal cue like turtle, right? Just when you see the impulsivity starting to get out of control, turtle. Or tap on the desk. Um, or write initials on the desktop report card. Again, a post-it note, an index card, and just like walk by randomly. And this can be homework time at home or in the classroom at school. It doesn't have to be a big time-consuming um, activity, but just that you're randomly keeping the child off guard and they're uh, looking for, okay, am I doing what needs to be done? Um, if a child's unable to handle a task at hand, then switch tasks or take a break incorporate some movement. Um, if they're unable, then, you know, they're unable. And so you have to really be mindful of what they're able to do. Okay. Overarching strategies, make a problem solving manual with the child. Take a little time. You know, let's have some things that we could do. We know um, working on your spelling words is really boring. So maybe we could do it on a trampoline or tossing a ball or with shaving cream in the back. Bathtub. Let's write these on a slip of paper and then we'll just pull them out when it's spelling word time. Um, have one for yourself to remember your go-to resources. Intervene at the point of performance. Talking before or after doesn't typically help the impulsive child because remember, it's always now. Um, you know, this isn't 
uh, a chronic condition. It's going to require ongoing strategies. And the types of things that you do, they can change over the life, lifespan, but you need to always have strategies. Um, Reevaluate them at the beginning and the end of the school year or at the winter break and assist with developing these. Don't enable, don't do everything for them um, because they've got to learn how to uh, manage things themselves, but because of the impulsivity, they don't know how to create these habits. Now, we just have a few more minutes um, modifying the situation. So at school, you know, I've been talking about things you can do, have good placement, have where the teacher can make eye contact, maybe make little tick marks on a paper. Um, group seating is not helpful for an impulsive child because there's all of that distraction, all of those ways they can blurt out or be overly physical with every child who's in the group. So very important to, to manage group settings. Uh, a dyad, which is two students, can sometimes work well if they each have specific responsibilities. Um, and it would be very helpful to change the seating throughout the day. You know, middle schoolers and high schoolers get to do it um, as they change classes, but uh, it's helpful for um, elementary students as well. Um, at home, determine when they need more scaffolding, you know, the extra help. Um, morning, homework time, bedtime, is it all of those? And create ways to help. Timers can be very interesting. Um, you know, hey, you've got one minute to pick up 10 pairs of socks. Or you've got 30 seconds to put your pants on. Or you've got uh, seven and a half minutes to get in and out of the bathtub. Or whatever the thing is. So timing sometimes makes things more interesting. Um, having some brief checklists or post-it notes where they actually check it off. Um, kids with hyperactivity and impulsivity need to move and need to talk. Need to move, need to talk. So you want to provide ways that they can interact with you. And if you notice, I'm putting most of the responsibility on the child for doing these things and for parents or teachers for just setting up the system. And then the child, you know, keep coming in, check in, parent, teacher, give a high five or put a check mark or something. Um, if they do need an adult to help them move from task to task, make sure one's available. Sometimes I work with families who are just so frustrated about morning times, and for good reason. Mornings are pressure cookers in almost every family. Everybody needs to get up, get dressed, get out of the house, and boom, start their days. And so if they're not able, remember, their executive functions are two to three years delayed. Then set up the situation differently. Modify the time allotted. Um, allow for frequent breaks. Um, most children with attention deficit don't have that big um, time frame that they can just pay attention endlessly to. Uh, remember the wagon wheel, right? Shifting all the time to something more interesting. So be realistic. Again, if the child melts down, it doesn't help anymore. Um, breaks so important. They need to be time limited and physical. In the classroom, they can be sharpen the pencil, go to the water fountain, at home for homework time or room cleaning time. You know, stop, everybody freeze now. Clap your hands over your head three times. One, two, three. Or if you have Nerf basketball or real basketball, go shoot one hoop, come back in. Run one lap, come back in. A break doesn't help keep them on track. If, if a break doesn't help keep them on track or distracts them to something else, um, then it's not helpful. So sometimes you have to start a new activity if they're not able to keep going with the activity that you've planned. Make time visible. Um, I have a, a slide at the end with a, a time timer, which is very helpful. Use sand timers, have countdown clocks, vibrating watches. Remember, the always now student can find time interesting. Um, here's some of those resources that I told you about, Behavior Charts and Beyond. I don't get any royalties or anything from it. I just think it's a great book. Here's a time timer. If you've never seen one of those, they're fabulous because they make time visible. You don't have to do math. You just look at how much of the red is going away. Um, I have a, a wonderful online uh, workshop for parents if you're interested in that. And I just published on uh, my website a blog for harnessing hyperactivity for the holidays. So, some of you may find that interesting as well. Uh, there's my information. If uh, you have questions or comments, let me know. And now we'll turn this over to the Q&A section.
when they're in a situation like at a um, restaurant and their child acts impulsively um, and runs away, what what are things that parents could do like in a public setting where um, impulsivity may be may endangering the child or they might get lost? Right, and that that is one of those safety issues. Um, it's a socially awkward situation, but more importantly, it's a safety issue. When you have a child who runs off, uh, sometimes children will do that at school or just you know out of the house, out of the front door, and and that's why dealing with the impulsivity is critical. These safety issues are at the the top of the reason, and so there's a couple of things. One, if this happens regularly. And guys, you're not going to like this. I, I, and I apologize for saying things that I know people aren't going to like, but then that child's not ready to be in a restaurant. End of story. Um, find some other types of places to go. But if it's just a random thing and it's just like, oh my gosh, what happened here? Well, safety always first. We have a hierarchy of needs as humans and being safe is the most important. And so you run after the child, get the child, find out what created the desire to run? Um, was there a kitty out the window of the restaurant or was the um, questioning um, grandparents or whoever getting too boring? Um, another thing is if you are, um, if you know that your child may respond that way, do things like get a booth and have them on the inside. Um, so situation selection, right? Um, so sometimes you don't go to the restaurant. Sometimes you have the seating um, that you manage just so. And if it doesn't work, then sometimes you just have to, you know, get in the car and go or have, you know, one of the adults uh, take a walk with the child. You know, some child, children just can't do it. Um, so it depends on the situation, depends on the age of the child. But number one is safety. So get the child, get them safe. If they're upset and having an emotional meltdown, don't bring them back into the restaurant. That's going to keep the, the meltdown going. Go for a walk. Go sit in the car. Um, this is when I know a lot of parents will just hand an electronic device and sometimes you have to do what you have to do. So no judgment here on that. But long term, you really want to be able to help them manage and, and talk through that. So um, wait until they're calm. Uh, set some some rules and say, okay, we're going back in, but you're going to sit um, on the inside of the booth this time, or uh, we're going to work on this coloring page this time, or, or whatever, find something interesting. At what age do you think that um, if impulsivity um, goes away? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, the good news is of all of the features of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And there are many, many, many symptoms and features. Impulsivity is the one that tends to minimize the most as a person um, moves into adulthood. Um, and even sometimes into the teenage years, uh, just depends on the combination of symptoms a person has. Sometimes the worst impulsivity um, is early on. And, and I think part of what makes it worse is not just that it's there, but that the safety issues are greater with younger children. And so there's not one pat answer. There are um, adults who um, have severe issues with impulsivity. Quite often, I, I sometimes see the physical impulsivity going down and the verbal impulsivity going up or the emotional impulsivity going up. And so um, it changes. Some people move into their adult brain, which for females is about 21, 22, somewhere in there, and males about 24, 25, um, and, and they don't carry any impulsivity with them or hyperactivity. They just might carry some inattention or the symptoms may resolve completely. We see that sometimes too. Not often, um, but it just, so it just depends. Uh, the safety issues, though, are the younger ages. How do you discipline a child um, when they're acting out and impulsively? More than anything else, uh, setting is, is important. And then the emotional state of the child. If a child is having a meltdown, let's use that running out of the restaurant scenario. And let's say the child um, 
didn't want to sit there anymore. It was boring and they didn't like their food. And so they just took off. And, you know, maybe there's relatives there have been asking them a bunch of questions about school and school hasn't been that great. They're just not feeling so good about themselves. So they're out the door and you, you, you know, run after them and you catch them and, and, um, and they're, you know, flailing and you, you get them to, to where they're, they're quiet um, or, or physically quieted, but they're still really upset. It's not the time to discipline them. It just isn't. Um, go back to that analogy of the broken leg, right? You have a child with a broken leg and you say, okay, you've got to run this race. And then when they can't run the race and they fall down and they're in pain, you don't yell at them. Um, they need to learn how to not do it. And that's by creating habits. It's by having conversations when they have logic present. When somebody is in the middle of a shutdown or a meltdown, there's anxiety, there's extraordinary amounts of adrenaline coursing through their bodies, and adrenaline shuts down your logic. They're not going to be able to respond or think. Now, after everything calms down, then you have the, the discipline conversation, like, look, this didn't, this isn't good. We can't have this. There's got to be some kind of consequence. So, you know, as a parent, this is what I, I think we're going to um, – you know, have to just practice. Sometimes you just practice getting up and uh, walking in and out of a, a space and sitting down. It's called a practice academy. You can do that. Sometimes you remove a privilege. Um, if it's too far after the event, though, it, it doesn't really hold a lot of weight. Um, uh, I find active discipline is very helpful where the child writes out a problem solving um, tip or talks through problem solving and then maybe we don't you know, get to watch our favorite television show or something um, just as an extra but that's not really the consequence honestly the consequence is the, the having to slow down and think through what to do next time um, or a little practice academy. Do you have any recommendations for good books or resources for parents? There, there are great there are a lot of good books out there and that's part of the problem my go-to, and um, this by no means is limited, in fact, why I didn't put books on the, the end of the slide, because uh, I'll just leave off somebody's favorite, but uh, my go-to is anything by Dr. Russell Barkley, and he is an expert in the field. He has books for parents. He has books for teachers. He has books for clinicians. Um, his work is all research-based. Dr. Barkley, I know, speaks regularly at chat events. He is retiring this year, so we're losing a legend in our field as far as actively participating. But my guess is we'll still see him you know, here and there. But his books are, are extraordinarily well-written, user-friendly tools. So um, Dr. Russell Barkley is, is my go-to when I, when I have to pick. Um, the next question is... Um from an, uh, an educator, they wanted to find out if there is anything they, they can do when they're when they're juggling um, many children in the classroom and then have a child that's acting impulsively. It, it is so difficult to, to be managing a classroom and, and an impulsive child. So the, remember the, the key factors in a child with ADHD needs to move, needs to talk, doesn't need a stage and always has to have the next interesting thing to do with a little bit of feedback. And so if you can set up the situation and to be preventative, that's going to help the most. Now, if a child is completely acting out in the moment and this happens regularly, then, you know, there's got to be some system of backup, uh, whether um, an assistant principal or a school counselor or whatever. And then that also is obviously getting involved with some parent meetings and that sort of thing. But if you can set it up, I've seen some teachers really do a good job of incorporating things that work for everyone, right? Like you have a reading center, uh, you know, even in, you know, sixth grade with a beanbag chair. And if the impulsive child just can't sit at the desk without annoying everyone in the vicinity, you know, very quietly without shaming, say, okay, you know, it's time to go to a reading center. Um, or, um, you know, Give, give some options where different students can, can do different things at, at a given time. Um, the little post-it note with the tick marks, 
um, on the desk where you just randomly come by just as you're as you're teaching or, or reading things and just like you know give a little you know high five thumbs up tick mark um, those are the, the things that can can help that redirecting though um, you know hey do you want to go hand out these papers or why don't you sharpen these pencils for me or try to keep them um, occupied in something that becomes interesting and you can usually redirect the impulsivity into the next interesting thing remember the wagon wheel so help shift them to the next interesting thing, even if it's not doing the schoolwork that you really need them to do. Uh, it's better than disruption, and you can work on ways to catch up the schoolwork, um, you know, at a, at a different time with your homework or library. But don't take an impulsive, hyperactive, impulsive child's research, recess away from them. Don't take it away from them. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> do you have um, any recommendations for parents to get um, we all know that a combination of um, treatment is effective, including parent training and counseling. Do you have any recommendations in those two areas on parent training and the types of counseling that might be helpful for parents and families when they're dealing with impulsive behavior? Absolutely. Well, look, we're at the mountaintop. Chat. <laughs> uh, the annual conference, the webinars, you know, the, the wealth of resources uh, available through Chad is amazing. Um, there are um, people like me in most communities. I even have a, a Zoom parents uh, group that meets for about six weeks in the spring for different ages on Zoom in like 30 different states. So there's there's people like me out there. Um, and I would assume that, um, you know, Chad is a good referral source. Look who's talking at the convention and see if any of those people are in, in your area. Um, uh, some cities have other organizations that help with attention deficit. Um, I find it's through these broader based organizations that you'll find the people who really know attention deficit. And as, as a psychologist who treats many different things and does evaluations for many different things, um, attention deficit has been one of my areas of, of intense work and research for for many many years and um and i find that there there's people with this kind of interest in training in a lot of the community so you want to look if you're looking for clinicians um who specifically talk about adhd traditional psychotherapy doesn't work and so I, and i do find that the parent training piece that's where i make the most inroads if i do work with a child I don't work with too many children individually anymore um, because I do more of this big picture stuff. But when I but I do have some students that I, I work with weekly. And when I do, I work with the student for about 30 minutes and then bring the parents in for about 15 minutes and have this child or teenager teach the parent what we've talked about so that the habit that I'm sprinkling seeds for then translates. Cognitive behavioral therapy helps with the emotional piece, a very solution-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. But traditional psychotherapy doesn't really work. It has to be a combination, a hybrid of organizational tutoring, kind of habit formation, and emotion regulation. So um, look to see who in your community might have that sort of um, approach. And uh, I think places like Chad and look and see who's speaking there that's probably where you're going to find your best support. Thank you very much. Yes, we just had our um, our virtual conference and we're getting ready to um, provide the recordings, which you um, spoke at our conference. Um, they're going to be available for sale and there is a ton of information um, and resources um, if you're interested in that as well. Um, so thank you very much for answering all of our questions. Um, this was so helpful. Um, is there anything that you wanted to cover or add before we wrap up for today? Uh, just um, stay strong. Parents and teachers, um, you know, there's a lot in the media about attention deficit. And um, unfortunately, a lot of it's very dismissive. And says, oh, you know, it's bad behavior or, or oh, you know, you just snap out of it. I hear that a lot. Just snap out of it. Um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a neurobiological disorder that has a myriad of issues that cause problems in day-to-day -day functioning. 
and left unchecked, uh, it, it can turn into a lifetime of, of difficulty. But if you stay strong as parents and educators at the front end, when, when you, you have the gift of this wagon wheel, creative, um, amazing person that you have some influence over, uh, use, use your power for good, not evil. And take the time on the front end to help develop some habits and strategies and routines. It's not easy, but you will reap rewards for a lifetime. So hang in there.